What can you say when you lose somebody like David Paul? God, he enriched the lives of everyone. Unbelievable. The thousands of people that he met, I mean, it was incredible. The most amazing thing about it from my perspective is the depth of knowledge and the humility by which he presented it. I mean, there's not many people like him around, folks, and he's not here anymore, but his legacy will live on forever because he trained one of the best traders that I have ever met, who was a great trader, Tom Hugard, and David Paul turned him into one of the greatest traders I have ever met. He's done things that I didn't think were possible, and it was mainly because of the work of David, and he was almost like a father to him, and it worked out great for both of them. He will certainly be missed. I was able to trade with David one day, and I was absolutely impressed about how simple the methodology that he used worked. His whole idea was when you find something that you really like and you know it's going to work and you have a pretty good idea what your risk is, you have to bet big. And that's what it was all about is risk little and bet big. And he did this with an incredible amount of success. David's personality is what really brought everybody together because of his love of the business, the way he handled uh, people. And he didn't have any strangers. Anybody that came up to him absolutely loved the man. And he he will really be missed. He, he was a really a stand-up guy. And I can tell you this, that by golly, I, I will certainly miss him. I only got to know him for about 10 years. But uh, it was really something to really know this gentleman. So if you ever see any work by him, pay close attention because he was the real deal. And he was a stand-up guy in anybody's book. Larry Pesavano signing off, folks. And may God bless. Uh, so uh, I don't know. I've told you guys this story, but uh, when my son started to trade, I told him yeah, to. Yeah, you told that story. Did I tell that on Friday? <laughs> when my when my son started to trade, I. Uh, I uh, told him to watch uh, videos of Tom at Saxo Bank that were done 12, 15 years ago of that order. And his trademark of the day was a, a three-piece suit, you know, with the old waistcoat and that dreaded black tie that he used to wear everywhere. <laughs> so uh, uh, Mike watched this and he uh, texted me back. He said, he's the James Bond of trading. <laughs> And to this, to this day, on Friday, uh, he sent me a WhatsApp message. He says, give my regards to Bond. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a compliment, I assure you, sir. A compliment. Uh, so, and uh, I believe Daniel Craig is giving the job up. So you could be in the running. I'll... I don't think James Bond ever had a dated accent, though. Well, I don't know. I don't know. With oh, the... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll shut so folks, uh, let's, let's, let's go into some charts, but you've been in lots and lots of charts. What I tried to do in the last two hours, uh, I believe from the bottom of my heart, uh, dealing with literally hundreds and thousands of traders, uh, that that's what they need. And unfortunately, the more they resist the stuff that I just spoke about, that will be directly proportional to their failure as a trader, I'm afraid, okay? Uh, coming to terms with uncertainty is difficult, really, really difficult, especially if, if you're from the professions. Uh, and in Chicago, they, they sort of use a dentist for uh, the, the classic professional. And you've got to say to yourself, a dentist wants to trade. What does he know about risk? What is the chances of you getting past that dentist receptionist without showing your credit card to pay for the bill? I don't know what Danish re dentist receptionists are like, but the ones in the UK, you wouldn't stand a chance. There'll be one grizzled battle axe sitting there and she'll want her look before you leave. Uh, so, uh, rule number one, the good trade is a hard trade. You know who taught me that? A delightful old man. He was one of the first mar market wizards, Michael Steinhardt. Do you know him, Larry? I know him so well. He's 90 these days, 91. Still he's still trading. My word, he's made a hemp. He trashed those... Uh, indices for 25 years uh, and he was the inspiration for me in fact buying oil right at the lows uh, that was a classic Michael Steinhardt trade and please google 
uh, Michael Steinhardt. Uh, he was one of the original market wizards. Uh, he has got cast iron, you know what, in his day. Uh, he was something. Uh, 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 really privileged to speak to him on one occasion. Uh, rule number two. Uh, I'm, uh, guys, the good trades are hard to it. I'm not saying it's intellectually difficult, okay? In fact, as I said on Friday, the thicker you are, the better, but it's just difficult to do. The market's roaring down, three big red bars. Puts the fear of God into you, and now some idiot tells you you must step in and buy it. It's really, really difficult, okay? Very difficult to do. Uh, so uh, that's a characteristic of a good trade. Uh, if the trade seems easy, there's a good chance you're just about to be sexually violated. And that's fine if you like that sort of thing. Okay. Uh, rule number two, I want to fade the short-term trend in the direction of the long-term trend. <laughs> He's smiling. Do you like that sort of thing? <laughs> okay. <laughs> We've heard all about you Danish fellas, yeah? Raping and pillaging. <laughs> Uh, so fade the short-term trend in the direction of the long-term trend. So what I'm saying is that I've got a long-term trend in place and I want to buy a pullback uh, and let it go again. Guess what that is? A, B, plus it's C, D. Okay, so uh, I wonder where I got that from. Uh, <laughs> and uh, then the third rule. I want to put my entries where the masses put their stops. How's that? On your way home, I want you to pass a building site. And on the building site, you pick up a brick, okay? You take that brick home, and tomorrow when you're about to put on your first trade, you decide where you're getting in. Just before you press the button, you pick the brick up and you go, smack it against your head. <laughs> That puts you into the present moment. And here's what I want you to do. Rather than buying the market at where you thought you were going to buy the market, buy them, put an order in at where you were going to put your stop and see how often the damn thing goes to your stop. Okay. So uh, place your entries where the masses place your stops. And this is another thing I learned from Larry is that the best trades occur when the masses have been stopped and trapped. So even if you don't get in at the cusp of the turn, if you can look back and see that a whole, just obvious on the chart, that lots of people would have bought there, and then the bloody thing went down again, nailed them, and then reversed. If you get in after those people have nailed, then you're in a much better place. Okay? And of course, that's difficult because we're scared of missing out. At least I am. Okay? Uh, so, uh, so I'm, I'm going to talk about a little bit about Richard Wyckoff. And I know uh, uh, many people say that volume doesn't work, but uh, volume, uh, especially in the stock market, is a great, great edge. And if I have the discipline, if I have the discipline to, in the stock market, to wait for volume coming to the party, I can get my hit rate up to 80%. Uh, when volume hits me between the eyes. So uh, Richard, Wyk Richard Wyckoff died in 1934. His work was carried on by many, many people. I bought his original course in the early 1980s, and I went through it. Uh, and please do not buy uh, uh, Wyckoff's works and his course unless you're prepared to put a great deal of effort into it. I'm not saying you won't do that, but it's certainly not something that you're going to take in on a Sunday afternoon while you're putting back three or four Frosties, okay? That's not going to work. He, he writes in the, uh, like the King James's version of the Bible, it's all these and the eyes, really, really difficult going as Gan did. So his three laws, supply and demand, uh, cause and effect, effort and result. So I'm, 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 my slides are not as good. Uh, and I've, So the, the rule is that the price action on the chart must reflect the volume action below it. Uh, if the volume demand is large and the price 
a move is large, then price is acting rationally. Uh, if they don't, then that in Wyckoff terminology is known as a non-validation. And that's a leading indicator uh, and an opportunity for profit. So, uh, for example, a large change in price and low volume. So we get a breakout on low volume, uh, then that's a non-validation. And markets on any time frame, rising and falling volume, need to be carefully watched. Uh, and all of this came from the old fellas, uh, Livermore, Wyckoff, uh, and a whole host of traders of that era just reading the tape. The only thing that was on the tape was price and volume. So what Wyckoff tried to do in his chart reading and his course was to try and give the retail trader the ability and the education to be able to read the tape in terms of price and volume. Uh, and I love the Wyckoff stuff, I really do. And it's a complicated theory. Uh, in the stock market, there's a gentleman called Stanley Weinstein that's written uh, quite a few books on the longer term uh, aspects of the Wyckoff technique. Uh, now, when I presented this before at the institutional level to a bunch of quantitative traders, they were not happy because they wanted something that they could quantify exactly. And Wyckoff is not like that. Uh, and he said in his course, look at the last 20 bars of trading in any time frame and make a judgment on the range. Is it high, average, or low? The position of the close, is it near the high, mid-range, near the close? And volume, high, average, or low? That's what he looked at. Now, you're more than welcome to quantify that even more. And certainly some of our vector vest people quantify volume uh, around a 50-day moving average of volume, higher or lower than a 50-day moving average of volume, and we can scan for that on vector vest. Uh, so let's just have a crack. Can you see the black bars on that? Uh, before Tom does it, I'll put those in a different color. But that's wide, average, and low. As, and that's close on the high, close on the mid-range, close on the low. Uh, I, I thought that would have come out better when I did it at home. Uh, uh, and uh, there's volume, high volume, middling volume, and low volume. So you just look back on the chart and you judge what's low volume, what's high volume, what's average volume. That's how Wyckoff did it. That's how I do it. By all means, quantify that a little bit better. But uh, in terms of validation, folks, if you've got a, a big range bar with above average volume that closes in the top 80% of the range or the top half of the range, then all is good. And in that moment, whatever that moment is, five minutes, one hour, one day, one week, one month, then you should do your best to let it run. Uh, and, and similarly, if you've got a narrow range bar, maybe you could put those lights down a little bit, sir, at the back there. Uh, there's not, uh, I, I should have made that a different color. I'm sorry about that. It looked fine on my computer screen at home. Uh, if you've got low volume and a very small range, that's also good. That's fine. So small result, small effort. That's good. Everything's in sync. Now, where you get a non-validation is that if you get a big bar on low volume. Now, that can happen easily at a breakout. And it can happen easily at the end of a trend, where the, the price keeps running on low volume. Now, let's look at the housing market at the moment, certainly in the UK and from discussions with Cathy in the US as well. Uh, we've got a situation where uh, prices are rising and volumes rising. I don't know what it's like in Denmark. Now, sooner or later, you'll find that volumes will stay up there and prices will go flat. That's the next step and that can happen very quickly. So we'll get a, 
Uh, if, you, if you examine the results carefully, you're going to get a non-validation between the volumes of, of homes sold and the prices. At the moment, everything's going rosy, but it changes very quickly indeed at the top of a market. That's the next step. Just watch out for that, any of you that are involved in property. Just look at the monthly stats. At the minute, volumes are rising, prices are rising. Certainly in the UK, that's the case. The next step will be that volumes stay up there, but prices just don't go. In other words, you get a flood of sellers into the market. All that volume can't push the price up anymore. And then all of a sudden, you get a turn. That's a non-validation. Happens in every market. Uh, so uh, now... This is an interesting one, and this happens frequently at, at the end, uh, and this is what uh, many traders call a volume climax, where you get lots and lots of volume and no movement. And that's the, the, the next step in the uh, housing market, in my opinion. Now, what's happening here? Now, this is going to be easy for the Danish people. Let's say that you're in your car on a miserable cold night right? And there's lots of snow around. And you're going up a hill. Use your mind's eye here. You're going up a hill and you put foot, as they say in South Africa, and you're moving up. And all of a sudden, the wheels start to spin on the ice. Yeah? And you put foot again. And you go a little bit further, but you can't make any traction. And then you put foot again, but it doesn't matter how hard you put your foot, you slide back. And that's what's called a volume climax. Lots and lots of volume, no action uh, in the price. That's, uh, that's, I think that's probably a quarter to two quarters away in the housing market, in my humble opinion. Okay, uh, so uh, that uh, is a non-validation, and that can certainly give you a heads up uh, on what's happening. So, and then that's a bar by bar non-validation. Now, it gets more interesting because we can now look at a multi-bar. And if you've got, let's say, three bars up, uh, you've got um, good ranging bars, the, the range is getting bigger on the bars and volume is rising, all is good, all is good. And the same on a down market. Uh, uh, but you can get a non-validation quite easily. There's the price rising. Uh, we've got a big, big range bar, but the volume can't come to the party. That's a non-validation. And that's saying that there's something up here. You've got to be careful. Now, the, the mistake that I made at the outset with volume is that I actually try to react to the volume, and volume's not like price. You can't react to it immediately. It is a, a subtle warning of the future. That's all it is, the heads up. You, so it could take three, four, five bars for the change. Similarly in the housing market, it could take many, many months for it to top out before it changes direction. But it's close in the housing market. What do you think, Larry? It's close. Never wrong on the housing market to ask her. Okay. <laughs> I will later on. <laughs> Sarah knows I don't follow. Okay. All right. Well, that, I'm watching it carefully uh, at the moment because I, I'm, as I say, I have a love of horses. I've got a horse in the country, but I need a place in the country to keep my own horse. Uh, and uh, a man is lost without a horse and a border collie. Uh, so, there is, uh, uh, this is a little uh, stock, and that at the last, it was going up nicely. And then at the end, we've got a, uh, at the end, we've got a bar. And as you can see, it couldn't close at the top of that bar on huge volume. That's a heads up. That's a heads up. There was a great deal, of, there was a lot of volume, but there was a great deal of supply at the top of that bar. All these things are, are heads up. You're not going to trade them. You're not going to put orders in based on this, but it's a heads up. And uh, if I see a, a non-validation, it's a, a reason not to add to a position. It's, in fact, a reason to actually lighten a position. So during the day, uh, and I'll show you 
a, a better schematic of this. Now, this drawing that I hope you can see more clearly, uh, I did at my first technical analysis seminar at the University of Cape Town in 1989. I had a full head of hair at the time. Uh, as price rises, folks, volume should rise with it. And as price pulls back, we should see volume drying up. Simple as that. And at this low, believe it or not, in that low, there's no volume at all, right at the turning point. So the great question, of course, and you all, you all must have said this to yourself, uh, the rule says buy a pullback, but when the pullback is occurring, your little mind is moving to the future and it's saying to yourself, well, this may not be a pullback at all. This could be a change in trend and I'm going to buy it and I'm going to feel like a right proper plonker. So if you see the price pulling back on falling volume, that's a very good sign that we're still in a bull market. And that's the primary definition of a bull market. Rising, ranges expanding on rising volume, pulling back on falling volume. If I see that, then I'm quite happy to buy into that market and, and you can see that as clear as day. So those of you that uh, give volume a bit of a hard time, on an intraday chart, if you see a couple of bars pulling back on falling volume, that's a great place to add. See a couple of bars pulling back, tiny little bars pulling back on low volume. Remember, a low range bar should be accompanied with, by a uh, low volume. Pulling back, tiny little bars, great place to add. If you see a pullback and rising volume, then the game can be up. Now that's a sign that we've got more likely, not a retracement, but a change in trend. I'll show you some examples of that in a second. Uh, and uh, this I took out of Wyckoff's 1929 course. And I had the artist, again done in 89, I had the artist put the uh, color around it. And if you can see, it broke, and it broke in rising volume, and then it pulled back on falling volume. That's what a market should do. Uh, in these if this is accumulation, you should see rising volume in the upswings and falling volume in the downswings. We just, the Victor Vest people, we've just had an example of that on Bloomsbury Publishing, where it went sideways for the last year. And in upswings, good volume, and the downswings, no volume at all. And Bloomsbury produced very good results the other day, and it flew up by a third. Uh, so the real world is something quite different. That's uh, an American stock, a uh, new core, uh, and uh, uh, it, uh, this, I'll explain this setup in detail, but I think Dr. Brooks did a good job of talking around it. It came back, it traded this double bottom, or uh, as we'll see in a second, a spring, uh, uh, pushing up and rising volume. And at this turn here, you can see that it came down, took out the low and reversed on above average volume. That's a very good sign. Uh, there was a little bit of uh, trouble here. Uh, it then went sideways on medium volume and then pushed back up again. But that was the clincher for me, uh, this uh, trade here uh, on the long side. Uh, and uh, uh, so that's, that's new core. Uh, This is an intraday chart of the S&P. Again, I'll explain the setup in some detail. Uh, and we, uh, the market pulled back uh, to this low. It then reversed and then takes off in rising volume. And then it goes sideways on falling volume. That's a great place to add. As you can see, this trend is now in a little bit of danger because we could get nowhere near the same volume. Uh, but it has another go. 
How's another goat in there? That's been my best trade of the quarter, CF Industries. These are the people that are responsible in the UK for all of the uh, CO2 in our cool drinks and beer. And there's a shortage of it again. The, the British government, they've got a plant up in the north, north of England, and the government had to bail them out to keep them here. Otherwise, we would have run out of CO2. Uh, and I, at the moment, there's a shortage of mineral water again or fizzy water again. Uh, as you can see, uh, we broke up on rising volume and we went sideways on falling volume. That's a cert. Uh, and then it breaks on, rise, on high volume. That's just a cert. Now, uh, there's a big trend there. Uh, the fundamentals on VectorVest were great. And it's in the throes of a long-term trend. Uh, and Tom, if you'll remember, I still use an 89-day moving average uh, for the trend. Uh, 21, 55, and 89, although I don't put them on the charts that often because I've been looking at them for so long that uh, I know where they are. But uh, if you need a hand to define the trend, 21, 55, and 89, where they all cross, I call that a bow tie, where they all cross, okay? Uh, so uh, uh, now this thing moved up, and uh, this is a bit of a worry here, you see? Look at that, huge volume, couldn't, that's where we were at the moment. Couldn't close at the top. I'll show you the rest of the chart in a second. Uh, uh, so uh, that's an example of, of trade entry. I took the, all the trades that I'm talking about here, I've taken them myself. And there's where we were. Uh, remember the, the bar that closed uh, halfway up its range on big volume, and it came back after that? And then one thing that happened, which was a heads up that worried me, is that the price fell on rising volume. And that was a heads up. I still took the breakout, but on the last little bit of the trend, the price is rising, but the volume couldn't come to the party, and then the bloody thing fell out of bed. So that, that last bit, there was two bits of evidence here. Uh, they, uh, the, Maybe where's that pointer go to, I wonder? Uh, the price fell in those red bars and rising volume, that was saying this trend looks complete. Uh, then it breaks and has a last hurrah on falling volume and then it gaps down. So there was, and that's what volume's like, folks. It's a subtle signal. It's not something, it took me a long time to work this out. I, I was actually taking action on volume very quickly indeed, but it's a subtle signal that the trend is in a bit of trouble. Okay? And that's how it should be looked upon. That's correct, yeah? That, that's a warning. You need to be careful. When you see that, you don't want to be get, you can certainly hold the positions you have. You don't want to be adding to positions in that environment. That's what I do. So I want to add to positions when I see price increasing and pulling back or going sideways on falling volume, and then I'm reasonably happy that it's going to break again. Good place to add. But when I see uh, evidence of non-validation, then, then I get a little bit worried about adding to the position. That's all I'm saying, and it's relatively subtle uh, and uh, that's why uh, many people give it a hard time. Uh, that's uh, also in food, sugar, flour, grain, Archer Daniels uh, had a great trade on that. Uh, it uh, runs up on rising volume and then it pulls back in falling volume. Now, here's what I taught my son, the very first setup I taught him. And it's probably an A, B equals C, D. Uh, <laughs> Market runs up, a, this is a stock. It should run up by 30% in six weeks to three months, right? It should run up on rising volume, and then it should pull back <coughs> into some form of consolidation, triangle, flag, rectangle, by the breakout. That's it. Tight little stop loss, try and make uh, three times as much as you risk. Uh, uh, and 
we found, he found by doing that that the, the share would run for, for th hard after the break, if it worked, it would run hard after the breakout uh, for five days. Let it run for five days, get your stop to entry, and then do your best to let it run uh, until A, B equals C, D. That's the, set, that's the only thing he does. He's got 50 million pounds under management. It's the only thing he does. So that's, that runs up, needs to move up by 30%, let it go sideways, let it break again. Um, this is CCJ, folks, and it's a great example. This share hasn't done much yet for me, but uh, it's sitting, uh, this is a uranium stock, and you can see clear accumulation here. Uh, big bar up out of that gap, and then, uh, as you can see, uh, it, good volume there, but a uh, uh, lot of selling volume. It then pulls back, goes side, pulls back on falling volume, runs again on big volume, runs again on big volume, runs again on big volume. It's now going sideways and falling volume. You can't do that with that level of certainty without volume analysis on any market and any time frame. The relationship between price and volume tells you who's running the market, whether the bulls are running a market, whether the bears are running a market. And I'm, I'm, I'm more than happy to admit, on a five minute chart, it gets very noisy indeed, and uh, much, much more difficult on a daily chart or an hourly chart. Uh, so, uh, uh, and that's what I teach at Vector Vest, and I do a, a webcast, so I'm blue in the face on that sort of stuff. Uh, uh, again, that's a stock that I, that's a trade that I took a little while back. It's my standard trade, folks. Uh, it moves up in rising volume, goes sideways in fall, falling volume, then it goes again. Uh, it couldn't be simpler. Uh, I love these patterns, and this is Vussy Mike's. Uh, that run up must be 30% in the share price from the last base, right? Uh, that should take place in uh, six weeks to three months, that 30%. It then pulls back into, in this case, a flag, and then it breaks again. Uh, and he then takes A, B equals, you know what, C, D for a target. That's the setup. Now, the difference between what I, what I, the difference between what's been presented so far and what I'm trying to motivate is that you should see a noticeable increase in volume in A, B, and a noticeable decrease in volume in BC to give you the strength for it to go again. Now, that's easy in the stock market. It's easy. And probably volume is much more reliable in the stock market. Uh, but you can see it in all markets and all time frames. And that's the basis of the Wyckoff work. And uh, that's the only thing that Mike does inside. That's the only thing he does. And. Uh, he does it very well. He doesn't look at anything else. Uh, now that's, I own this share. Uh, it's called Togela, it used to be called Amco. It's now Togela Resources. And this is an interesting one. You can see the little flag here. This is, it went up by 30%, it went from four to six. It went up by 50% in that run. Then goes sideways. Now, moves up, that last bar was in good volume. And then we've got these two red bars. And the red bars, as you can see, uh, produced very, very little results. So we had uh, big volume, but they were down bars. So lots and lots of volume going in, but the market couldn't get down. That's what Wyckoff called bag holding. Uh, it then goes sideways, and then it breaks up in big volume, that's a classic trade, folks. That's just classic. That's a beauty. That share's gone from three pounds, four, that was listed at three pounds. It's gone from three pounds to nine pounds now in, uh, what, uh, nine months, uh, if that. It was listed, Anglo-American had to get rid of it when that conference was on up in Scotland. Do you remember the COP conference up in Scotland? It's coal. They had to get rid of it, and they listed it in a fortnight. Uh, uh, and, uh, then all of a sudden, coal goes from the Antichrist itself now to something that people need to keep the lights on. 
Uh, so uh, that's uh, quite a simple little trade. Uh, and uh, that's a punt for my VectorVest program. That's earnings per share. That's the VectorVest valuation of the share. And those of you that are technicians, all of you are technicians, you should see the classic cup and handle pattern before that as well. But at the end, I only traded the flag pattern. Uh, uh, and this back in the day, that's Zoom. That's one of my best trades. Uh, that's back in the day. It's, it's given all, all this all up again. Uh, there's my moving averages. That's earnings per share flying up on Zoom. Uh, we had this big run up, the gap on big volume, and then it goes sideways. I didn't trade that first bit. And then it rises again on rising volume, and now it pulls back on falling volume, and then away it goes again, and it flew from there. So that's a classic setup, folks. Uh, uh, and there are the two, that's 21 and 55, uh, and it was at that stage significantly undervalued by VectorVest, uh, and that's a very simple way to make a living, uh, finding those. Uh, uh, and that uh, is Tesla. Is that a flag setting up in Tesla? I'll be trading it. Push up. I don't know what's going to happen next. Push up happened in rising volume. Get a couple of, see this? Get a couple of small little bars on average volume. That's good. And now it's going sideways on falling volume. That's going again. Let me take glory by association. Can I take, this is Hemingway. He said that he liked to take glory by association. That was one of his expressions. Uh, my two sons went to the same school as Elon Musk. How's that? I'm taking glory by association. <laughs> so uh, uh, I think that that's going to go. Uh, uh, so the bear market, folks, as the Irish would say, is the same, only different. Where's that man I spoke, Kieran? He's going home, I think. Uh, 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 the price in the bear market, the price should fall and the volume should rise. Uh, and then we get a rally on falling volume, and that's where you want to short it. Now, that's one of the most reliable trades in the world. If you've got a trend down, and a rally on falling volume. That's the only time I would consider shorting a stock. Rallies on falling volume, and the last two bars you'll find will be really narrow range bars before it changes its mind again. And then it should fall on rising volume. There's no non-validation there. Again, this comes out of Wyckoff's 1929 course, or 28 course. A break on rising volume, and then a rally on falling volume, then it goes down again on rising volume. Uh, now, I was, I, I remember yet yeah, Friday, uh, way back on Friday, uh, I was short the uh, SPX, uh, but that's the spider, and I like the volume figures on the spider much, much better. Uh, uh, and you can see way back here, uh, in the first wave down, Look at this huge print here at that low. And you can see that uh, that's an end of day chart as well. You can see that uh, this market, in fact, uh, opened, went right down and closed. Huge, huge bar, huge, huge reversal, enormous demand at that level. Uh, we actually get the same thing here. It takes out the level, huge. Now, these are the two biggest volume days uh, for the last five years on the spider at that level. Uh, and then it runs, and as it runs up over the last week or two, the last 10 days, it's run up in falling volume, and that's why I was looking for any reason to short the bugger up there on Thursday or Friday. On Wednesday, my first trade was, a, a, was too, the stop was too tight. I got stopped out, but uh, I made it all back plus on uh, Thursday and Friday. A nice, I'll show you the trade in a second. So a run up and falling volume like that, folks, uh, that's a heads up. And you don't want to react to the darn thing straight away. You need clearly a, 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 a signal from price action, but uh, it's a heads up. Uh, and that, that's the, uh, uh, that's the uh, price, that's the cash market uh, uh, chart. That was my attempt on uh, Wednesday, I think. That was a 15-minute chart. It broke down in rising volume at the open. 
And uh, I always like to watch the open bar on a 15-minute chart. There's always a lot of volume, obviously, it just has opened. And uh, just see what the first 15-minute bar looks like. And uh, that one, in fact, couldn't. Uh, uh, it went right up, and it couldn't stay up there. There was certainly supply came in up there. So that was the basis of my trade. And then all of a sudden, it rallied on falling volume, and I thought I was quid zen. But no, alas, alas, there was noise up there and I got stopped. It was a very small loss, but uh, I, I was quite, uh, I, I thought that maybe that was going to be a big one. I had to wait for the next day. Again, the same sort of thing. Uh, on the stock market, I want to see a 30% fall. I want to see a rally. And that's pretty much what we had on Friday on the S&P 500. And then I want to see it fall again, and you guessed it, AB equals CD. The rally down should be in rising volume. Sorry, the move down should be in rising volume. The rally should be in falling volume. And that's one of the most certain trades that you can have. And there was an old fella out there called Cohen, and he had a company in New York City called Chartcraft. And he was one of the original founders after Wyckoff on point and figure charting. And I met his grandson some years back, a guy called David Cohen. And his granddad had made this conclusion that markets are significantly more predictable on the downside than they are on the upside. And his, old, his granddad had proven that over many, many years. Have you met old man Cohen? Chartcraft? I, I don't know. Yeah, Chartcraft in New York City is run by David Cohen, the original chap's uh, grandson, first class fellow. Uh, uh, so uh, you don't have to make it complex. Do you know what? And I don't mean any disservice to people who didn't grow up. My ex-wife told me once upon a time that I could complicate the Lord's Prayer. Uh, so uh, I can make life very complicated for me. And I mean no uh, harm to anybody that wasn't dragged up the same way as myself. Uh, but I, I tend, I can make things far, far more complicated than they are. Uh, uh, for a high probability trade, uh, I want to see evidence of a trend up or down. I want to see then, in a bear case, I want to see a rally in falling volume. And then I want to sell the hell out of it. Simple as that. Uh, tight stop, try and make three times as much when I'm right as I am when I'm wrong. Uh, I've got some more examples. That's a, a, a classic short. Uh, that's JD Sports. It's a high street uh, sports shop. Uh, this is a while back, folks, but it's just a classic one. I rarely short in stocks. I'm happy with shorting the index. But we can see this big print on the downside. And then it rallies on falling volume, can't get up at all, and then it falls out of bed again. Uh, so uh, this one is uh, a stock that I'd held. I was out of it well before this. I didn't short it. But you can see that this is now rallying, and this flag, this thing, uh, rising wedge or uh, three drives pattern that Larry talks about. Uh, and as you can see, uh, right at the apex of that, there's just nothing there at all. Nothing, apart from rat, rats and mice. And then it fell through the bloody floor. So, uh, uh, and again, I guarantee if you do an AB equals CD, you'll find the target pretty much. All right, so uh, uh, we made a heap of money at Vector S on this one last year. I mean, a heap of money. We were in it from these lows. And then I added again uh, when I got that breakout on huge volume. That's always a great sign. A big, big bar on huge volume. Uh, and uh, then got out of it up there. And then this, you see this, rose for a couple of weeks. And volume on that week, pretty much zero. That's a huge non-validation. And then we get the outside bar, and the bloody thing falls out of bed. Uh, so, and it's still falling out of bed. Uh, this is on a, an hourly chart, price rising and falling volume, uh, and that's and then it fell out of bed again. That's uh, ages old, I think. Uh, I did that these for Tom's last seminar. So let let me go on to my final little bit. It's a quarter to five, uh, and. For years, and before I met you, Tom, I had a little, the book had fallen apart. Uh, sorry, sir. Uh, would you be more inclined to take a short after a uh, pullback in a, in a, 
with the falling volume, would you be more inclined to take that short than you would uh, for an up? No, I would take I would take both, and I'm probably better on the long side in the stock market. Okay, okay. Uh, happier on the long side. Uh, uh, I, I rarely short stocks themselves. I'm more than happy to short the index, but uh, if you want to short the stock market, uh, a rally on falling volume in a downtrend. In other words, an A B equals C D down. Uh, where the A, B, C, uh, C, B, C is on f falling volume, that's as good as it gets in this line of work, okay. in my humble opinion. Uh, it's a more reliable trade than the long trade. Yeah, that was good. Okay, more reliable. Yes, sir. I, I can't hear you, sir. Uh, that is uh, uh, Wall Street, yeah. So where's the volume coming from? Uh, I, 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 I took uh, e-signal volume uh, for years. From the index? Uh, um, and, uh, from the index, from yes. The, from the futures market, yeah. That's where they get it from. I took uh, e-signal volume for years, and then I found out that the trading view volume was exactly the same as the e-signal volume, so I stopped trading. I stopped e-signal. Okay, so if you add the volume and you get the uh, on trading view, on trading view you you've got it. Yeah. From the futures market. Yes, that's correct. Yeah, that's where they get it from. Yeah. Uh, so uh, uh, it's exactly the same. I tried it forever, and uh, e-signal is a temperamental sword. Uh, So this little book of Wyckoff's, it fell apart in my briefcase. And he said so beautifully that you can make a living by trading springs and up for us. Trading these setups represent the essence of my method. It involves establishing trades at the danger point where the risk is least and the profit potential is greatest. And schematically, that's how I've drawn these things. So, uh, I trade most of them with the trend, although you can pick bottoms with them, but I don't need to. I, I, I'm not hungry enough to do that. I, I'm looking for market to come up, to find resistance, to pull back and kiss that resistance, to push up again, and then come back and clip that low and run. Now, it can be the same as a Gartley pattern, but it doesn't have to be. It just needs to get its nose down below that low. Similarly, an up thrust is a it finds support or uh, demand in uh, Wyckoff's language a couple of times. It then breaks, goes up, kisses, comes down, and then goes up and takes the old top out by a tick or two, and that's called an up thrust. Uh, and there's the theoretical part of it. Uh, you can trade it with the trend or you can try and pick bottoms with it. I only trade it with the trend. Now, when it breaks, this little bit at the bottom, Mr. Gann called lost motion. Now, when it breaks up, 40% of the time it comes back and kisses the level, 40% of the time. 60% of the time it goes. So 40% of the time you get a test. Now, there is, a uh, uh, a, a classic, this is on platinum, uh, and that's a classic uh, uh, Wyckoff uh, spring technique. We've got resistance, it comes back to here, runs up to here, and this bar, should this reversal bar should occur on rising volume. And I, I would be a buyer on there at the next open, Stop loss under here. And you can see how it came back and kissed. You see that? 40% of the time it does that. It'll come back and kiss that level. Uh, some people say that you should, in fact, buy the test. And, of course, that means that you miss the 60% that don't test. 40% of them test. Uh, uh, I tend to get in on a close above uh, the level. Uh, you can buy the level if you want, but uh, that was a particularly good one because this is an outside bar. Uh, and do you know what? 
I know I'm a bit of a one-trick pony, but I don't do much more than that. And I get enough trades around the market to keep me well, uh, well fed and watered by doing that. Uh, now, this is an example that's setting up that I'm going to be talking to the VectorVS people about tomorrow afternoon. Uh, this is gold fields. Uh, and you can see this run up on rising volume. And now it's pulling back on falling volume. Hasn't shown a great deal of volume on the breakout as yet, but it came down. And I like this bar because it reversed on a pretty much average volume. A bit more would have been better. But uh, uh, that, to me, is a classic Wyckoff spring. And that's something that I should be personally trading. Uh, OK, that's gold fields. Uh, that's the 21 moving average. If you put the 55 on there, the 21's above the 55, is above the 89. And that means the trend's intact. And on VectorVest, the fundamentals are great. Uh, uh, there, uh, I think we looked at these on Friday. This is last week on the uh, S&P. That's a one hour chart, which is where I try and look for most of my trades. Because when it's, it's not called a spring for nothing, folks. When it, if you sit and wait for them, you're going to be very happy because they spring. And they go like the clappers. And you're not sitting there in angst. They either go like the clappers or they don't go at all. There's nothing worse than sitting in a trade that's going bloody well nowhere. Remember, the tail must never wag the dog. You're there to make some money to buy resources. It's the only thing that life's about. Maybe the odd border collie. A border collie is the price of a good car. Do you know that? 20,000 pounds for a decent border collie. A yeah, dog. 20,000 pounds. Where do you find these people? There's a queue, Larry. There's, for a decent, well-bred border collie, you're going to have to put your name in and wait for six to nine months. Can I wait for 90 months? <laughs> <laughs> but they're, 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 they're worth waiting for. Uh, so, uh, uh, but, <laughs> I'm not a pet person. You're not. OK, all right, all right, OK. Uh, there's nothing more uh, pleasant than a dog. Uh, that's the one thing. I haven't got a dog at the moment, but it's the one thing. Never, I'm never going to have a wife again, but I'm going to have a dog. Uh, OK. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, I don't mean that in any nasty way at all. <laughs> uh, but. Uh, uh, and I've been pricing dogs, and that's why I know exactly uh, the price uh, for a decent border collie, yeah? and there are people scrumming over them at twenty thousand uh, pounds. So here's the, the we got resistance, folks, and the damn thing goes up, can't get up there, and then it pulls back and kisses that, and then it reverses, and that's it. There's nothing more to it than that. The wake off spring, and then the bloody thing springs. Now this is another one. Maybe some people would have got in there, and that happened in the morning, uh, about 10 o'clock. I didn't take that one, but that's at the open. And uh, it moves up here, and then it comes back, and you see the test? There's the level, and it comes up, comes back, tests, and then goes again. I got in on that one after the test. Uh, now, where are you going to get out? Well, you can use Larry AB, AB equals CD. That'll be perfect, absolutely perfect. Or you can use a, a, a 1.618 extension of the pullback if you're a Fibonacci fan. But you've heard Larry yesterday uh, and speaking from the bottom of his heart about the power of the AB equals CD. So that's a good place to be looking for a target, where AB equals CD. OK? Yes. Sir? Uh, what is the lowest time frame you would use volume as an indicator to make a decision? Uh, I, you can use it right down to a five-minute chart, but it become you're going to. Have, I would suggest that to get your to get your interpretation correct, that you would look at an hourly chart for the next week or two until you get the feel of it. But by all means, you can look at. But it works pretty well in a 15-minute chart. Okay. Uh, uh, but uh, it's noisier on a five-minute chart, and probably more. It's like any any form of stats. The more 
the more observations you have, the more accurate they become. So uh, on, on a longer time frame, the edge effects get canceled out, especially in, the st in any market. People buy and share things for no other reason. For, for example, your granny dies and leaves you a quarter of a million pounds. You go out and buy stocks. You've bought stocks for no other reason than your granny left you the money. And, uh, and all of a sudden, you run up gambling debts uh, to 250,000 pounds, and you've got to go out and sell stocks to pay the gambling debt. Uh, there's got nothing to do with the stocks themselves. So there's all sorts of edge effects in there, all sorts of noise in there. People buy and sell things for all sorts of, of reasons that have got nothing to do with the actual instrument itself. Uh, so the longer the time frame, the more reliable. Start with an hourly chart, uh, or even better still, start with a daily chart uh, and work your way down. Uh, if you're trading the indices, keep your eye on the spider, the SPY. The volume on the spider is a real good leading indicator for any other index in the world. Uh, so that's two good examples. That's last week. I haven't cherry picked them, but they do come like London taxis, folks. You know, you, you get six, and you, you stand there for hours in the rain, and then six taxis come at once. All right, that's just the way it is. Uh, so uh, uh, let's go a little bit further, uh, and then I promise I'll let you all. That's. I think that's the same one. That's a spring beauty down there. Now this one, there's no shoulder. I took it anyway. It didn't work that well, I, I, but it worked finally. But I, I got out of it. Didn't get back in here. But that's textbook. There's the shoulder resistance. Here, there's no shoulder, and those are always dodgier. I like that. I like to see a resistance, support, support, and the way it ran this low. That's a clear stop running exercise. Look at the spring. Just a beauty. Uh, absolute beauty. Uh, so uh, uh, that's a five minute chart. It works in all time frames. Uh, that's another five minute chart. Worked perfectly there. Uh, Maybe a bit more agricultural, but not bad down here. Uh, on, uh, that's in the Dow Jones. Uh, there's another one. Uh, came back once, because right down, that's at the open. They, they frequently happen in the first hour, a couple of hours, where it runs up, comes back once, has a go, and then comes down. I think Dr. Brooks showed a couple of examples this morning where that happened this morning. He was in and out two or three times but I'm, I'm more than happy to wait for the spring, okay? Uh, and sometimes, of course, they just go and you miss it. That one was good down here, but the second one, I was waiting for it. I remember vividly, I just kept on going. Uh, that is another five-minute chart. Uh, that was a judgment call, folks, because it actually didn't take out this low, so it wasn't... Uh, everything else was perfect, and we could see the volume shooting up here on this first bar, uh, and uh, I took the trade anyway, but maybe I was scared of missing out. I'm more than happy to admit that. Uh, uh, and now the opposite is the upthrust. That's the schematic of the upthrust, uh, and uh, that's a good example. I think that's in Forex. Uh, their support comes up once and goes right up, and then you can see the capitulation at the top, huge amount of supply coming in at that old top. We chart one of those, what's it called, shooting stars, and then uh, it falls and falls like a stone. Uh, uh, that's, that's gold the other day. Now, the Victor Vest people, I was trading this last Monday afternoon, if you remember, in the uh, 130 session, uh, and that was, I got in underneath that low, and I had that order. I put the order in before I went to bed on Sunday night. And uh, I got that taken out. <laughs> Larry, when you talk about pets. I have to make an apology about the dog. I just uh, no, I didn't mean that. I'm a, uh, that's, it's it's good, man. It's good. It's good. It's good. At one stage... I had, I was trading the pound against the dollar against the yen, and I had one of those projectors, and I had the dollar against the yen projected against the wall on the bedroom, 
so I could wake up in the middle of the night and have a look at it. I was much more, I was much keener. I was much keener in those days. And maybe that's why the wife left. But I, I had to, I was much hungrier in those. I'm 66, folks, and I'm, I'm, I don't need that much money. Uh, everything that I used to spend money on, I've given up. So um, uh, I finally had to get rid of the projector because the border collie at that, at that I had, uh, she stayed around after the wife left, and the border collie would bark at, this, bark at the wall during the night because it was interfering with her slumber. So I had to finally get rid of that. Uh, so this was last week, uh, and uh, I think that this is an AB equals CD here. In fact, I'm sure it is, and I think it's a 38% retracement as well. I don't know, uh, but it went up, took out that top, and then it reversed. It tried to get down rallies, and then it broke that level on uh, first, first, well, in the first four-hour bar of Monday. And then it goes back and tests. In fact, my very words to the VectorVest people last Monday afternoon, I hope that the test is over, okay? And then uh, it uh, fell and fell very nicely indeed until I did this. Uh, it then went, it, yeah, it stopped at this low on big, big volume. There was demand came in at the low. Uh, and I'm betwixt and between now and on gold itself. Uh, that low that we see here, right at 1900, uh, there's a big high on the daily chart six weeks ago. Uh, so uh, I thought maybe gold was going to go back to about 1850. Uh, but we've now seen very determined support at the 1900 level in gold. So uh, we shall see what happens tomorrow. Uh, uh, that, let's see what that, that's, that's uh, Glencore. That's an up thrust on Glencore. Uh, frequently, folks, you'll find that these things get run in the news. And that, I don't know what the news was there, but it went right up and clipped the high and then reversed again. So uh, that's news trading. Uh, and uh, like, I, I avoid it like the plague. Uh, and uh, that is another up thrust. And I, I'm finished now, but I've got, I want to look at uh, trading view. I think I've got it open for the, that was Friday. And I was in uh, this trade. I was looking for any reason to short it. And I shorted it on that bar where it fell on rising volume and had broke. There's a trend line there as well. Uh, I was looking for any reason to short it. And I know that's not good to talk at a seminar, but uh, uh, that's because at the 4-6 level, we had that big up thrust on the daily charts. I was looking for any reason to short it. And as it broke down uh, on big, big volume, that was my reason to short it. Then went back and tried to test, and then it fell out of bed. Uh, and I held it overnight. And I should have, there's another little spring here. Sorry, up thrust. There's no shoulder, but it does this. And it's an AB equals CD as well. Uh, and it does this. And uh, I should have added to that position here. I didn't because I was, uh, I was in fact, on my way. Uh, I was wandering around outside uh, because you guys moved here uh, without letting me know. Uh, now, uh, the target in this, and I took profits on this when I was sitting up there uh, uh, listening, uh, uh, and I, I, if you draw a, a fib extension, there's an old high here on the chart. There's a range here, uh, uh, and uh, as you can see, uh, I always draw a, a fib uh, and extend from there to there and looking for that target, and I took profits at 4515 on that, which was the construction that I had in place, and then all of a sudden we got to move up into the close. I think that on the indices, folks, we've had five waves down, uh, and five waves down is, a, a, is a, an impulse wave. I think now that we've got uh, probably a, a bit of a correction to go that will take us up for two or three days, and then we'll see what happens. We really will see what happens. It is my, my, my count on the Dow is that uh, that high at 4600 was a wave five of wave three, and what we're in now is a wave four, 
and uh, we've now got a wave five to come. So I think there's another new high that could take us up into May in the stock indices, and then we'll see what happens. You've all read about the two and the 10 inverted. There was a PMI report on Friday. What did that come in at? Does anybody know? The, uh, my, looking at this generally for many years, the, uh, the last PMI, the, the, the 210 inverting, invariably forecasts a recession, but forecasts a recession about six months out. Uh, uh, the PMI, the last PMI was 60, and PMI industrial was 61. So if you get a PMI coming down under 50, plus the 210 becoming inverted, then that's a much more serious signal. So as long as that PMI sits up there at about 60 level, uh, I think we can have more upside. There's no bears. There's, people are still too bearish. So I, I think that the, the last bear needs to be silenced before uh, it goes down. Uh, so I'm still optimistic, but I'm overly optimistic. Uh, folks, that's me finished. Uh, I, I've kept you far, far too long. Uh, and I hope I didn't bore you with the trading psychology stuff. Please humor an old fella like me and do your 30 trades, okay? More than help you, happy to help you any, any way. It's traderdavy, D-A-V-Y at gmail.com. Trader, D-A-V-Y at gmail.com. Uh, anybody that wants a, a trial at Vector Vest, folks, uh, I'm going to set up a special group for people who sign up at this uh, and I'll mentor you on the uh, swing trading uh, setups. It's 95, uh, and if you go to vectorvest.co.uk, uh, you can take that trial, and uh, I'll uh, do my best to mentor you in swing trading in the stock market over a few weeks or a few months. It's quite easy money, uh, uh, and uh, it'll cost you a fiver for 60 days. So if you want that, uh, you can either sign up e uh, online or just email me about it, and I'll do that for you with the greatest of pleasure. Uh, it's, it's, it, I wish I could give it for free, but I can't. The Americans would freak. It's £5.95. Uh, so thanks very much indeed. Take care. <laughs>